Okay, hello, Wednesday's Physiology Lab. Hope everybody's doing okay today. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Marissa. All right, so we're almost done with the remote part of the semester. There's this week and there's next week. And then we're gonna be in person doing, doing real labs, in-person labs. I'm excited about it. Okay, so there are two assignments that are due Sunday, February 6th before midnight. Uh, one is called Lab 4 Part 1, and then there's a quiz. Next week, we're going to be doing the sensory lab. A lot of this we can do remotely. We're going to do part of it as a group and then part of it on your own. So I'm oh, going to ask you. Are you uh, recording? Am I recording? Yep. I believe so. I can check, but I have to stop the share. Hang on a second. Yes, I'm recording. OK. Thank you for double checking, though. I have been known to forget that on occasion. All right, so before we do lab next week, um, there are going to be some documents you need to print out so that you can fill those out while we're working as a group. So take a look at the lab before we meet next week. So what we're gonna be talking about today is protein synthesis, how the cell makes proteins. You may have heard some of this before. Hopefully we're gonna go into more detail than you've seen in the past. So we're gonna talk about mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, transcription and translation. Can anybody tell me what the M in mRNA stands for? Messenger. I think I heard that. That's messenger. How about the tRNA? What is the T? Is it transfer? Trans transfer is usually what it's called. But yeah, really close there. How about rRNA? Oh, I got a new one for you. Ribosomal. So the ribosomes, the location where proteins are manufactured, are made of both proteins and RNA. What is transcription? Is it kind of like um, when you're like copying or like recording of what's happening? Copying is a better way to put it. Okay. Um, in the case of the cell, we are copying the information of the genes from the DNA to the messenger RNA. So it's the same information, but the DNA stays in the nucleus. The messenger RNA carries the information to the ribosomes, which are outside the nucleus. What about translation? What is a translation? 
Like translating from one language to another. Exactly. Going from one language to another. In this case, you're, you're translating from the language of DNA and RNA. So you're going from nucleotides to the language of proteins, which is amino acids. So to start understanding this, we're going to start by looking at DNA. DNA consists of two strands of nucleotides. The nucleotide has a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. And so you've got one, two, three, four, five. This one's five nucleotides long. The sugar and phosphates alternate with each other to form what we call the backbone. When we look at two strands of DNA forming this typical double helix, you can see those alternating sugar phosphate backbone parts twisting around the outside. You can kind of picture this like a ladder that's been twisted or a spiral staircase that's been twisted. And that sugar phosphate backbone is the outer edges of that twisted ladder. The bases bind to each other, they form bonds to make up the steps of the ladder. Because this is DNA, the sugar is a molecule called deoxyribose. The DE part means without, oxy is oxygen, so this is a ribose sugar missing one oxygen. Tells you what it is right there in the name. And our four bases for DNA are adenine, which is abbreviated with an A, cytosine, C, guanine, G, and thymine, T. I'm gonna erase this stuff over here with the transcription and translation, so. There we go. When we look at these bases in DNA, adenine always bonds with thymine. And cytosine always bonds with guanine. You never see them bonding with the different pairs. It's always going to be apples and trees, adenine and thymine, and cars and garages for cytosine and guanine.
and the information is coded in the sequence of these bases. Okay, everybody following at this point. I see a lot of heads still down. All right, I'm going to clear the screen. If nobody tells me to stop. So let's see how well everybody is paying attention and understanding what I've said. There's a quick poll up. Again, as usual, it's anonymous. Waiting on one more person. There we go. Okay, so it looks like we've got a mixed bag. Everybody got that cysteine always bonds to guanine. Excellent. That's going to be very important for this lab. Phosphate group and sugars. That's not... Uh, it's, it's clear that there's a lot of confusion there. So I'm going to go over that again. So I'm drawing over here a strand of DNA that is not forming a helix so that it's it's been straightened out. See how it looks kind of like a ladder? So the sides of the ladder Oh, that's a huge arrow. The sides of the ladder are made up of the sugars and phosphates. And I'm sorry, I put it over the arrow. Why are you not doing what I want you to do? There you go. And the rungs of the ladder are made of the base pairs the adenine, the cytosine, the guanine, and the thymine. And when we have it in the double helix form, it's the same structure, it's just twisted.
Okay, hopefully that clears that part up. So the first part of protein synthesis is the transcription, going from DNA to RNA, specifically the messenger RNA. So there are differences between DNA and RNA. The sugar is different. So DNA has deoxyribose, RNA has ribose. And right there is the oxygen that's missing in deoxyribose. So if you're not familiar with these kinds of drawings, if you haven't had chemistry, let me walk you through what you're looking at here. This oxygen has a covalent bond with a carbon here and a carbon here that anytime a line turns in one of these drawings, there's a carbon. This carbon is bonded to this oxygen and a carbon here. This carbon is connected to this carbon, which has a hydrogen and an oxygen attached off onto it. This carbon is attached to a carbon, a hydrogen, this carbon, and this oxygen. So all of those lines are bonds. All right, so that's difference number one, the sugar. Difference number two, RNA uses a molecule called uracil instead of thymine. The uracil look, it looks pretty similar to thymine, but they're a little different. Difference number three, RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. Now, a lot of these differences, specifically um, the use of uracil and the fact that RNA is single-stranded, means that RNA breaks down faster than DNA. DNA is a longer, it's a more stable, longer lived molecule. That's why we use this for information storage because an RNA information would break down too fast. Okay, let's see how we're following along on this part. There's another quick poll. Still waiting on a couple of people. There we go. All right. Did a lot better on this one. 
RNA is single-stranded. The sugar in DNA, that's what the D stands for, deoxyribose. So most of you got that one right. And the base found only in RNA is uracil. Okay, not too bad. So DNA, the information on the DNA is transcribed into RNA in the nucleus and the RNA leaves the nucleus, goes out into the cytoplasm of the cell and finds a ribosome. And the ribosome is where the synthesis happens. The DNA exits the nucleus, finds a ribosome, and then is going to be translated into a protein. So we often see or say DNA to RNA to protein. What that means is DNA transcribed to RNA, which is translated to an amino acid sequence to make a protein. This is what is called the central dogma of molecular biology. So I have a question. I'm gonna give you two, two bits of information here. There are four bases in DNA or RNA. And there are 20 common amino acids. How can four bases code for 20 different amino acids? Sequencing, sequencing is just um, reading the information off of DNA or RNA, but you're close. You're heading in the right direction there, Brenna. So I'm gonna clear the drawings and we're gonna to go to the next page. Yeah, technically there are five if you count the bases in both DNA and RNA but the RNA only has four bases in it when it goes to the ribosome. So this is how it works. That was a dirty trick asking that because it is a tricky thing. Codons. This is what we call a codon table. A codon is three bases that code for one amino acid. So if you've got a gene that has 60 bases, that would make a 20 amino acid protein. So you need three times as many bases in the DNA or RNA as you have amino acids in the protein. And we read a codon table like this. If you have the codon AUG, the first letter of that codon is on this side of the table. So it's A. 
So that tells us to read this row. The second letter is U. So we want to look down this column and that gives us this square. Now in this square, we have four choices because we've got four different options for that third nucleotide or base. The third one is G. So that tells us AUG codes for the amino acid that's abbreviated MET. I am not gonna require you to memorize the names of all of the 20 amino acids. If you do biochemistry, you'll have to learn them then. So if I'm asking you to use a code on table, whatever the three letter code is, that's fine. This is methionine. Methionine. So that tells you this codon codes for methionine. Is that making sense to people? Do you need, want me to go through? I'm sure you want me to go through another example. All right, so we've done AUG, let's do CGA. Which row do I use? One, two, three, or four? Two. Two, exactly, this row. And now which column do I need? One, two, three, or four? The fourth. Four. four, good. So we have CGA and that codes for? Arg. Arg, arginine, a pirate's favorite amino acid. That was really cute. <laughs> I have to admit, I got that from a student the first time I taught biochemistry. <laughs> All right. So there are a couple of things that I want you to look at on this table. We have three codes that say stop. Those are stop codons, and that's exactly what they do. They tell the ribosome to stop making the protein. So I haven't told you guys this, but oh, geez, that's a big fat line. When we make a messenger RNA, there's extra parts at both ends that are not used to make the protein. They're there to prevent the messenger RNA from being broken down too fast, so it's most likely to get damaged on the end. And also so that that RNA fits better in the ribosome. It's kind of like if you're trying to sew and you're threading the needle, if you have the end of the thread right in the hole of the needle, it's not gonna work. You have to have some extra part hanging out the other side. The other thing I want you to notice is for a lot of these amino acids, like serine here, there are four different codons that code for serine. Actually, there's a few more over here, but we're just looking in this box. This means that if there is a genetic mutation in this part of the gene, it doesn't matter. If you've got a gene that originally said UCU and it changed to UCC, it doesn't matter. 
because you get the same amino acid, which means the protein is going to be exactly the same. This is a huge benefit because it means that there are lots of simple mutations that can occur in your DNA that are not going to have any effect. They're not going to change the amino acid. It's not going to be a problem. All right, so I like these codon tables like this. There is another type of codon table that's the wheel. I don't like the wheel as much. It's just a personal preference. It doesn't really matter. It's the same information. You start in the center, and if you're looking for that AUG again, any codon that starts with A is here in this lower left corner. Anything that starts with AU is in this section. And then AUG is methionine. And it also says start. All proteins start with the methionine. So that AUG also tells the ribosome where to start making a protein. So all proteins will start with a methionine and then end with one of these um, stop codons, UGA, UAA, or UAG. If you take a biochemistry and your biochemistry instructor asks you to memorize this, they're being a jerk. <laughs> Nobody memorizes these. <laughs> so why is there a five in the center of this circle and a three out here at the end? Make sure I, yes, here we go. When we are reading an mRNA sequence, we read mRNA from what we call the five prime. And I'm gonna explain this until you understand it. To the three prime. Okay, you, it makes sense, right? You have to read the gene or the messenger RNA in the correct direction. If you read it in the other direction, you're not gonna get the same protein. So here we are in our nucleotide. We've got our sugar here, a phosphate group here, and our base here. The sugar, when you're describing it, you number the carbon atoms in the ring. And so the carbon atom right here that the base attaches to is carbon number one. And then we have two, three attached to this oxygen, four, and then five is sticking up from the ring. It's not part of the ring. So those are our carbons in either ribose or deoxyribose. So what we mean when we say the five prime end, it means the end up here where the number five carbon is at that end. And the three prime end, the number three carbon is the one that's at that end. So if we follow the chain up, this five prime carbon is connected to a phosphate group, which is connected to another nucleotide. 
this three prime carbon is connected to a phosphate group, which is connected to the next nucleotide. So the sequence would, would repeat itself as five carbon and then the three prime? Yeah, you'd have five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime. And you start reading it from the five prime. Have you ever watched the, uh, the show, The 100? No. It's um, end of the world scenario. And at, by the end of the storyline, they, uh, they look for different uh, planets that they can inhabit. And some of the survivors made a, a habitation and they are geneticists, but the, um, the hierarchy of their social structure uh, are led by primes. Now I know why. Yeah, <laughs> now you know. Okay, good. All right, now, I'm not going to show you a picture of a nucleotide and ask you to name the five prime or three prime carbon. I'm not gonna ask you that, but it is important that you know which end of the mRNA to start with. All right, so. We're gonna talk about translation. And I'm going to talk about it and you're going to be confused. And then we're going to go watch a snippet of video and hopefully then it'll make a little bit more sense. Translation has three parts. Initiation, elongation, and termination. I'm grabbing some props here. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see these, but we'll try. Okay. So here is your messenger RNA. And here is your start codon, your AUG right here. Now this is one of those transfer RNAs. And a transfer RNA, the tRNA, brings the amino acids to the ribosome and connects the correct amino acid to the codon. Your tRNA has a funky little, almost clover leaf shape. I am really crappy at drawing on the, the screen here. I'm better on the whiteboard, I promise. So here is your mRNA, here's your tRNA. We're starting with AUG on our messenger RNA. How do you think the tRNA knows which spot it's supposed to bind to? How, how do we know the correct tRNA is gonna end up here? I'm just gonna tell you, cause you're not, you're probably gonna not get this one. It has the sequence U, remember U bonds to A, A, C. We call this the anti-codon. So it's got that sequence right here. And so that will form a bond. And at the other end, it has, the amino acid methionine.
So initiation starts when this tRNA that has a methionine finds that AUG codon on the mRNA and forms bonds. Now the ribosome has two parts. The small subunit attaches to the mRNA right away, but the large subunit doesn't come in until that first tRNA is in position. And then the large subunit comes in. This whole ribosome has three pockets in it. We're gonna see this in the video much clearer. The first tRNA, the methionine, is gonna be in the center pocket, which means there's another codon, the next, oops, did not mean to do that. The next codon, UUC, is open in the, in the um, first pocket. This tRNA comes in. It's got the anticodon that bonds to UUC. It's bringing in a phenylalanine and it slides into that first pocket. Then the ribosome moves one codon down the mRNA strand. When that happens, the bonds between the tRNA and the methionine get replaced with a bond between the methionine and the phenylalanine. That original transfer ENA is now in the third slot and it's empty, so it's going to be released. The second tRNA is now in the middle position and the next codon is available in the first position to bring in the third amino acid. And so you're not gonna be able to see these. I can't see them on my screen. So we've got our first amino acid. Here comes the next one forms a bond. Here comes the third one, forms a bond, and we get our, our polypeptide forming. And that goes until a stop codon. And the stop codon says, no more, we're done. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna go now. Where is? I've got a little video. There's a link to this whole video on Canvas. It goes into a lot more detail than we're going into. So it may be a little bit confusing but the ribosome part is good because it's so much easier to see on an animation than it is me just talking about pockets. So here's a ribosome, pocket one, two, and three. I can't figure out the sound, but it's closed caption. So we're gonna, we're gonna play it at half speed. So you have hopefully enough time to read the captions and look at the animation.
All right. Questions? No, everybody's got it. Great. So in the video, it was taking it from the first three. And then when it moved over to the second one, the polypeptide chain is what's building on top of that. Mm -hmm. but it's only reflected on the third one of where the chain is. Could you repeat the question? I'm just a little yeah. confused because as it's like in the video, as it was moving down, mm -hmm. um, like down the sequence of like on the screen, you have like A U G U U C mm -hmm. and then C G A. At the end of the video, it was only on top of like the C G A where the polypeptide chain was. Is that like how it looks, or is that just like for the the circumstances of the video showing that it moves down like this and then the one in the middle like next the one on the left went away and then it was just left with that yeah oh yeah yeah um that's just demonstrating the process oh okay um this one goes away and a new one comes in they just didn't show the next one coming in okay thank so you is is the process of this like to um, build up the polypeptide to a certain strain and then and then end it or is that yes so the polypeptide polypeptide is a term that just kind of means a short protein and so what happens is you're making that shortened protein and When the protein is finished being made, so you've got your shortened pro short protein here, your polypeptide chain, you reach the end, then it has to do what's called folding, which is forming, whoop, not breaking hopefully, but forming a final complicated three-dimensional shape. Initiation is your first amino acid. Elongation is adding each amino acid after that. And then termination is when you stop adding amino acids. Did that clear that up? I, I think so. I was just trying to understand like, why is this even happening right now? Because <laughs> it's it, like, <laughs> you mean why do you have to learn this or why does no it... no no like hey, with the the adding and the the sequence like I, i'm trying to uh, i'm trying to conceptualize and understand like what the translation even is like what's the purpose of it so yeah so the concept that i'm getting is that there's a start and then you make the sequence and the polypeptide would be the sequence. So when that finishes, then you have a termination yes. and that's the whole purpose of it, right? Yes, but what you have at the end, once you've terminated, it folds and it's a protein. Folds into a protein. Okay. Yes. So the, the end result is a protein. Oh, translation is the process of making a protein? Yes. Okay, and then initiation, elongation, termination are the steps of the come out with a protein. Yes, exactly. Okay, and they all start with AUG? Or that's, is that like? Pretty much, uh, there are, a, it's science, so there are always a few exceptions. Yeah, but for, um, like for our purposes. For our purposes, it always starts the mRNA always starts with AUG. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else you want me to go back over? Okay. So now. 
I'm going to find the Zoom meeting again. Now I want to I want us to look at the lab that is on Canvas and what you guys are going to need to do. So what you will have, let me let's just look at this page. You have on your second, third, and fourth pages, a DNA sequence of a gene. What you need to do I'm just trying to find all this stuff. There we go. Is you want to take that sequence and convert it to an mRNA sequence. So remember, T always binds with A. A. And A always binds with T. T, except when we have RNA, that's a U. And C always bonds with G. G. So the TAC on the gene becomes an AUG on the messenger RNA. When we make our messenger RNA, we then have to bring in tRNAs that have the anti-codon. So again, A on the messenger RNA is going to be a U on the tRNA. U on the messenger RNA is going to be an A on the tRNA. And G on the messenger RNA is going to be a C on the tRNA. So you're going to fill out these two columns, and then you're going to look at a codon table. So let's go back to the codon table. There are we going? And we can figure out our amino acid sequence. I wish I could show you. Can I show you multiple screens? I don't see any way I can show you multiple screens at a time. That bites. Okay. And it erased all my writing, but you'll fill out your amino acid here. So we, we know we start with methionine. Now this, if we were in a classroom setting, I would have a whole bunch of um, paper clips. <laughs> yeah, clear that. And we would have our colors of paper clips um, that correspond to the different sequences, and we would make strings of paper clips like I've made here. I doubt. Anybody, I doubt most of you have a whole bunch of colored paper clips sitting around. So don't worry about that. You can put the colors in here if you want to um, get some crayons and, and make colored dots. It helps you visualize what's going on in this, the next two steps. So this is, this is the first step. Do you guys think you understand what you need to do here? I see a couple of nods. I see a thumbs up. Good, good. Okay. Now, I want to show you this, and then we're going to talk about the next part of the lab. So, 
I've been telling you we've got all these amino acids. And when we talk about the colored amino acids, I'm sorry, the colored paper clips for the amino acids, the colors are actually signifying something about the amino acids. So we can organize the 20 common amino acid into groups. One group has charges on the side chain. So this part of the amino acid is going to bind to this part of the next amino acid binding to this part of this amino acid. You see how these all have that oxygen with a, with a double bond and then a nitrogen here and this other stuff off the end. This other stuff is what varies. This part is consistent with all of the amino acids. So the side chain or the part that's variable on some of these has a positive charge or can have a positive charge, which means it acts like an alkaline or base chemically. Or they can have a negative charge, which means they act like an acid. Then we have some amino acids that have polar side chains that do not have a charge. Polar also means polar hydrophilic or water loving. These amino acids are most likely going to interact with the cytosol. So they'll be on the outside of a protein, for example. And then there are amino acids that are hydrophobic. Those amino acids are either gonna be on the inside of the protein or embedded in a membrane. You can have all different kinds of amino acids on a protein. But these hydrophobic ones might just be on the interior. They might just be important for the final shape of the protein, or they might be in a membrane to hold that protein to a membrane. And the colors indicated on the table on the, the assignment correspond to these categories. Now, when we look at the lab again, oops, hang on, there we go. The next page is going to have a genetic mutation. This is going to be a base substitution. So one of the bases, the base right here, which is a C on the original gene is going to become a G. So then you're going to have to do the same process. You're going to write out the mRNA, the anticodons and the amino acid sequence and see what kind of a change that causes. And the last one is adding a base and see what kind of changes that makes to the protein. So we're looking at two different kinds of relatively small genetic mutations to see what effect those have on proteins. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about mutations. We all have 
genetic mutations that we were not born with. All of us. Most genetic mutations are harmless. One of the reasons for that is because of the multiple codons per amino acid. And another one is if you have a mutation in the gene for uh, one of the genes involved in hair color, but that mutation is in a cell in your liver, it's, it doesn't matter. You're never going to see it because your liver doesn't make hair. Likewise, your liver breaks down alcohol with an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And if your skin has a mutation in alcohol dehydrogenase, it doesn't matter. So the type of cell the mutation occurs in also is going to determine whether that's a problem or not. So this shows you your original chromosome that has, we're gonna call this um, three, I'm sorry, six genes, gene A, B, C, D, E, and F. You can have a genetic mutation that is small, like a single nucleotide, or you can have, as shown here, a whole gene deleted. So in that example, gene B is just gone. Our next example, somehow you ended up with two copies of gene B. You have a duplication. Both of these situations are more severe or more likely to be severe than single nucleotide changes. You can also have what's called translocation, where we have our original chromosome and we have a different chromosome that normally has different genes on it. But some of the genes from our original chromosome were translocated onto a different chromosome. And the genes from that different chromosome end up on our original chromosome. This can cause huge problems. We think of our DNA, we think of genes, we think of the part that makes the protein. But the majority of our DNA is actually involved in regulation, in determining which genes are going to be active and how much mRNA is made from those and therefore how much protein is made from those. So a translocation separates a gene from the regular portions of the DNA that control when that gene is used. You get the same thing if you get what's called an inversion, where a couple of genes from one end of the chromosome end up on another part of the same chromosome, again, you're separating the gene from its regulation. Anytime you screw up regulation in a cell, bad things happen. So, as I said, most genetic mutations are harmless. If there's an effect, it's usually harmful. The least likely outcome is a beneficial change.
And one of the harmful things is cancer. Cancer cells have lost their ability to regulate cell division and they often end up with lots of chromosome problems like these, these big translocations and duplications and that kind of stuff. Okay. How's everybody doing? Good. You think you can do the assignment? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. We all have genetic mutations, Brenna. I don't know if you're talking about a specific thing, but that is interesting. Yeah, genetics is, is, is always very interesting. Once you get past Gregor Mendel and the dominant recessive stuff. All right. If everybody is happy with that, we can call it a day. So yes. in filling out this um, uh, this assignment, we can just refer back to this video and should be able to finish it all the way through? The video, and I posted um, the PowerPoint. So you have the codon table and the different types of amino acids. So you can look up uh, which ones are hydrophobic, for example. Okay. And I did post a link to the video. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And yes, Josephine, this lecture will be on YouTube. Um, maybe this afternoon, more likely tomorrow. Um, and I just had a question. You said that there was a, it was a quiz that was due on Sunday? I think so. Okay. Will that be, I didn't see it up in like our modules yet. I just saw the lab for part one, which is the lab. Um, Let me take a look. Lab four. Ah, you're right. I didn't post it. I will get that posted um, shortly. Okay. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Good catch. Okay. Then I will see. 